Welcome. Thank you for continuing on this ongoing journey that I find by turns challenging, sometimes upsetting, often comforting, surprising, unpredictable, at times enlightening, and even engaging. I once had a teacher of meditation who suggested, if you do nothing else, just find a few minutes each day to breathe. That is where the idea for this break to breathe originated. And the onset of the pandemic presented the opportunity to begin in a communal way. Speaking of community, with so many others around the world, as well as those who specifically feel a connection to Chautauqua. I was horrified and saddened by the vicious stabbing of Salman Rushdie as he prepared to speak on the topic of free speech in the United States in a forum renowned for its openness to rational discourse and debate. The Chautauqua Institution is dedicated to rational thought scientific inquiry, and humanitarian values. It is a gated, but not security-obsessed enclave, primarily because it always felt and was so safe. Although it was not founded or intended to be a place of privilege, it has become that by virtue of economics. Quite simply, financial resources are needed to maintain and grow the institution. As I have struggled this week to make sense of the crime, if such a thing is even possible, it has been interesting to me that none of the usual tropes are applicable in this situation. It was not a mass shooting, thank God. It was not racially motivated and was not a protest against inequalities of race. The perpetrator was not a terrorist in the um, sense of the word we have come to think of it. We are so accustomed to finding someone or something to blame for the larger context in which horrific crimes happen. And that was the initial instinct here as well. And I'm quite sure that we can blame a fundamentalist Islamic theology that cannot tolerate divergent views and issued a fatwa against Salman Rushdie. It was narrowly focused and specifically targeted. The bottom line then is that this was a hate crime perpetrated by a zealot who had a weapon that has been around as long as humanity. He used a knife. Assassination, which this was intended to be, dates back to the earliest governments and tribal structures of the world. In recent history, the names of Abraham Lincoln, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, Mahatma Gandhi, and Martin Luther King Jr. come immediately to mind as victims of hate crimes. Such crimes come into our world for a multitude of reasons. They are always misguided and only exacerbate the issue for which the perpetrator seeks retribution or justice or satisfaction. We might vainly wish that the would-be murderer had listened to Rushdie before trying to kill him. Even while we know that had he waited until the end of the program, he would not have changed his mind nor truly heard what had been said. I have been reading recently about the act of listening, particularly is formulated and articulated by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, the Kronoli Bracha, who, as you know, is one of my very favorite scholars. He writes movingly and inspiringly about the word Shema, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. We all are familiar with that word. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. He writes about the word Shema as one of the most important words in our tradition. And he writes as well about the act of truly listening, which is much harder 
than it might seem to be. I quote, Shema is one of the key words of the book of Deuteronomy, where it appears no less than 92 times. It is in fact, one of the key words of Judaism as a whole. What is more, it is untranslatable. It means many things to hear, to listen, to pay attention, to understand, to internalize, and to respond. It is the closest biblical Hebrew comes to a verb that means to obey. Let's pause here for just a moment before we continue down this journey of discovery of the many meanings of Shema and its impact. And let us just take that initial break to breathe where we close our eyes. So we in fact close off the, 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 um, the sense of seeing and don't use necessarily, but have more accessible to us the sense of hearing. So, Let's, let's take our meditative positions and plant our feet firmly on the ground, plant our bodies firmly in our chairs or wherever they may be, standing, lying down. Let us sit with ease, but with attentiveness, with a sense of quiet energy. And if closing your eyes is something that is comfortable for you, I invite you to do that or to gaze just softly at something indeterminate in front of you. And let us prepare our insides for this process, for this embodied exercise. And we can try to release all those places that would inhibit a full incoming breath into our entire bodies. So we start at the tops of our heads and try to release our scalps, our furrowed brows, let us relax them. Even as we speak about listening, let us imagine that our ears are just resting, hanging comfortably from the sides of our heads. Let us release our jaws. Ooh, that's a good one. And our tongues, which carry so much tension in them, a tongue really is a muscle, and so it can be held very tightly. Let's scrunch up our shoulders and release them and allow our necks uh, to fall to the front and fall to the sides. And hang backwards. Oh my. <laughs> That's one of my big spots. And we might just think about our arms, our upper arms, our lower arms, our elbows. We could do one arm at a time, which might be the most helpful way to do it. And ending with each of our hands unclenched, open, facing upwards, ready to receive whatever will come in the next seconds, the next moments. Let us release our internal organs and the process of digestion that is so fraught with tension. And let us imagine that our insides are just letting go.
and that that release allows us to soften our waists and our hips, our thighs and knees and lower, lower legs, our feet, swishing our toes into the sand of a beautiful beach. And let us take that first breath. Oh my. Just fully and deeply, completely. Sometimes I take another catch breath to be sure that I'm truly filled. Think about all the places where the breath might go and how it feels in all of those places. And we can hold it for a moment, not getting tense, just not letting go yet, not releasing yet. And then we can release. Again, slowly, quickly, Whatever seems to work, and you certainly might experiment each time. But the point is to just think about this breath coming in. Although we might be most aware of how it sounds. And how it feels. and follow its path inside of our bodies and go with it down our arms or down into our tummies, our filling our lungs, filling our lungs and seemingly moving down from there. And letting it go. And hearing that, hearing the exhale, There's nothing to see. Our breath is invisible. But we can hear it. Or not. We can even take our breath and be sure not to hear it. And let it go in silence if that's what we choose to do. I'm just going to review for a moment what Rabbi Sachs said about the Shema is untranslatable. It means many things. To hear, to listen, to pay attention, to understand, to internalize, and to respond. It is the closest biblical Hebrew comes to a verb that means to obey. In general, when you encounter a word in any language that is untranslatable into your own, you are close to the beating pulse of that culture. To understand an untranslatable word, you have to be prepared to move out of your comfort zone and enter a mindset that is significantly different from yours. At the most basic level, Shema represents that aspect of Judaism that was most radical in its day, that God cannot be seen. God can only be heard. Time and again, Moses warns against making or worshiping any physical representation of the divine. Moses insistently reminds the people that at Mount Sinai, the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form there was only a voice. This affects our most basic metaphors of knowing. To this day in English, virtually, virtually all our words for understanding or intellect are governed by the metaphor of sight. We speak of insight, hindsight, foresight, vision, 
and imagination. We speak of people being perceptive, of making an observation, of adopting a perspective. We say, it appears that when we understand something, we say, I see. This entire linguistic constellation is the legacy of the philosophers of ancient Greece, the supreme example in all history of a visual culture. We have only to think of the ruins of Athens or the sculptures of ancient Greece to realize how visually focused that culture was. Judaism, by contrast, is a culture of the ear more than the eye. As Rabbi David Cohn pointed out in his book, Kol Haninuva, excuse me, Kol Hanivua, the Babylonian Talmud consistently uses the metaphor of hearing. So when a proof is brought, it says, Tashma, come and hear. When it speaks of inference, it says, Shema Mina, hear from this. When someone disagrees with an argument, it says, Lo Shemiya Le, he could not hear it. When it draws a conclusion, it says, Mashma, from this it can be heard. Maimonides calls the oral tradition, Mi Pi Hashmua, from the mouth of that which was heard. In Western culture, understanding is a form of seeing. In Judaism, it is a form of listening. For me, Rabbi Sachs's most important insight has to do with relationships and conflict resolution. As he writes, there is something profoundly spiritual about listening. It is the most effective form of conflict resolution I know. Many things can create conflict, but what sustains it is the feeling on the part of at least one of the parties that they have not been heard. They have not been listened to. We have not heard their pain. There has been a failure of empathy. That is why the use of force, or for that matter, boycotts, to resolve conflict is so profoundly self-defeating. It may suppress it for a while, but it will return, often more intense than before. Job, who suffered unjustly, is unmoved by the arguments of his comforters. It is not that he insists on being right. What he wants is to be heard. Not by accident does justice presuppose the rule of audi alteram partem, hear the other side. Listening lies at the very heart of relationship. It means that we are open to the other, that we respect him or her, that their perceptions and feelings matter to us. We give them permission to be honest, even if this means making ourselves vulnerable in so doing. A good parent listens to their child. A good employer listens to his or her workers. A good company listens to its customers or clients. A good leader listens to those he or she leads. Listening does not mean agreeing, but it does mean caring. Listening is the climate in which love and respect grow. In Judaism, we believe that our relationship with God is an ongoing tutorial in our relationships with other people. How can we expect God to listen to us if we fail to listen to our spouse, our children, or those affected by our work? And how can we expect to encounter God if we have not learned to listen? Shema Yisrael, listen, hear, attend, pay attention, Israel. If you want to understand any relationship between husband and wife or parent and child or employer and employee, pay close attention to how they speak and listen to one another. Ignore everything else. 
How might the world change if we truly listen to each other? It is a possibility worth considering and even trying in our own corners of the world, in our own lives. So let us breathe in that prospect and all that might follow from it. Let us retake our positions, perhaps do a quick internal rundown, external rundown. And let us focus and breathing. And as we hear the breath going in, we understand that listening is a receptive process, an actively receptive process. And as we release the breath, we might imagine releasing ourselves from the necessity to say something in return, to think ahead to, to what we're going to respond, to only half listen because we're already formulating our response. And as a way of focusing our attention, we might think about taking breaths that do have sound, releasing breaths that similarly can be heard. And trying on a breath that makes no sound or no discernible sound to our ear. We might mix that up. You an inhale with sound and exhale with none, vice versa. And it is a good time to gather all the people who have preceded us, that we knew, that we miss, all of those whom we pray might join us someday. We breathe in paying very close attention to the sounds of right now because our eyes are closed or unfocused at least. I hope you will continue to breathe in and out, to experiment with the sound of your breathing, the length of your breathing, the style of your breathing, the tempo of your breathing, right here, right now. And by way of conclusion, guidance and inspiration, I hope for the coming week, I would share with you this poem entitled, Please Listen, a poem by Leo Buscalia. When I ask you to listen to me and you start giving me advice, you have not done what I asked. When I ask you to listen to me and you begin to tell me why I shouldn't feel that way, you are trampling on my feelings. 
when I ask you to listen to me and you feel you have to do something to solve my problem, you have failed me, strange as that may seem. Listen, all I ask is that you listen. Don't talk or do, just hear me. And I can do for myself. I am not helpless, maybe discouraged and faltering, but not helpless. When you do something for me that I can and need to do for myself, you contribute to my fear and inadequacy. But when you accept as a simple fact that I feel what I feel, no matter how irrational, then I can stop trying to convince you and get about this business of understanding what's behind this irrational feeling. And when that's clear, the answers are obvious and I don't need advice. Irrational feelings make sense when we understand what's behind them. So please listen and just hear me. And if you want to talk, wait a minute for your turn and I will listen to you. I pray that you will have a week of deep listening to the heart, to the meanings of another, that you will listen to your own soul and spirit in discerning what it is you may need or want. And may it be a good week, a week in which you just stop to breathe every day. And that provides you with energy and impetus to go forward. God bless you. I will see you next time. Take care. <laughs>